Good morning, everybody. Um, the figure I'm going to look at today is St. Colin Banas, um, the first and the greatest of uh, Irish missionaries. Um, I'm, I was asked to talk about his idea of peace and what peace meant to him, so I'm not going to talk about the history of Colin Banas or the history of his mission or the influence, historical dimension of, of his work. I'm going to look at what he understood as peace to mean. So I'm going to spend quite a lot of time looking at the background what were earlier people's ideas of peace, so I can say something about Colin Bannis's unique contribution to, to the debate about uh, what peace meant. But very first, very, very quickly, to sketch his background, Colin Bannis was born probably in the year 443, 543. I think they choose the year 543 because for historians that's an easy date to remember. He's born in Leinster and he emerges at the top of his profession in the great northern monastery of Bangor uh, in the northern part of Ireland. Um, he must have had some sort of an existential crisis or maybe a midlife crisis because in 591 he packs his bags and he heads off to, um, he heads off to the continent. And he, he, he lands here and he, makes, he heads for the capital of the local king. So Columbanus goes to the continent and he makes a beeline for the money. And he secures lots of money and he secures uh, considerable resources to establish a series of monasteries in the, cent in, in, in the Vosges Mountains here. Um, on into mo what's modern, modern um, um, Austria, and down into Bobbio, the last of his foundations in northern Italy. And these monasteries become very, very important cultural uh, focuses, centers of learning on the continent. They produce the leaders of the church on the continent. So Columbanus's contribution and his legacy is long-lasting. It, long, it, it lasts long beyond his death. Um, I think it must be because Columbanus journeyed so far from the very north of Ireland to Italy in the south, south of Europe. Uh, that led to an event in 2004 when the church solemnly proclaimed Columbanus to be the patron saint of bikers. Um, now, when I, think of, when I think of Columbanus, that's an image that springs to mind, uh, not so much a leather-clad leather hell's angel, um, but Columbanus was something of an ecclesiastical hell's angel, uh, and I'll, I'll, I'll tell you why now. When Columbanus comes to the continent, um, he's coming to Europe, European mainland, continental Europe, um, when the empire, the great Roman empire, this global empire is in terminal retreat. It's collapsing across, across Europe and its focus is shifting increasingly to the east. But that empire, at its height, you can imagine, the legacy of that empire was very long lasting. So much of the life of the continent in the course of the sixth century was still profoundly influenced by the Roman Empire and its ideals. Um, it's an empire which stretched from Scotland in the north to the sands of the Sahara, Sahara Desert in the south, from the Atlantic shore of Portugal in the very west to modern day Iraq in the extreme east. And by any standards, that is an enormous, that is an enormous empire. That is a truly global empire. The Romans, when they looked at the world in which they lived, when they looked at the universe that they lived in, they looked at the, at the skies and they saw stars and planets moving through the skies in harmony without ever crashing into each other and more importantly without ever, ever crashing into them. And from the great celestial bodies to the tiniest of creatures on the face of the earth, these creatures existed in, they coexisted peacefully in harmony. So from a Roman perspective, the rationale that held the whole of creation in existence was peace. Peace was the driving force that allowed all of the elements in creation to exist. And from a Roman perspective, what happened in nature, through the laws of nature, the empire was attempting to do that in the human sphere, in the social sphere of the life of people. Because that empire is holding together tribes, nations, peoples, whose natural instinct was to tear each other to pieces, but through the empire, they were being held together in the bonds of peace. This was the ideal behind the, uh, the Pax Romana, the Roman peace. And um, one of the greatest monuments of that world to the ideals of peace is this, the Arapacus, the Arapacus Augusti, the altar of the Augustan peace, which was put up at about the same time as the birth of Christ. So this is the altar of peace in the center of Rome put up during the reign of the Emperor Augustus, the emperor who was associated 
by tradition with peace. He is the figure who achieves what was previously felt to be impossible. He achieves universal peace. That is according to his propaganda. So I want to spend some, sort of, some time looking at this monument and what it signifies, so then I can begin to look at what Columba, how Columbanus responds to these ideas. Uh, this is what the monument looks like. This is um, um, on this panel and on the corresponding panel on the other side is Augustus and his family. So this is a, a message from our sponsors. And underneath, there is this, what used to be seen as a sort of a decorative motif. It's an acanthus plant. It starts here, as you can see, and it spreads in all directions. Okay, so it's just one single plant, and it's spreading right across the face of this enormous and very, very impressive, impressive monument. You get a better, a better idea of it here on the smaller panel. It starts here and spreads upwards and outwards in all possible directions. And if you get up close and personal to this plant, you'll see that it is populated by creatures. There are frogs, there are birds, there are serpents, there are scorpions, all sorts of life existing and coexisting peacefully in the branches of this representation of this plant. And this serves as a metaphor for the empire itself. The Roman Empire is spreading in all directions, and as it spreads, it sustains all life in peace, in peaceful coexistence and in harmony. And it's an attempt to show that this great man-made empire is fully consonant, is fully in tune with the forces of nature that hold all of nature in, peaceful, in, the, in the bonds of peaceful coexistence. In 2009, uh, there was an attempt to reconstruct this monument as it would, as it would have looked uh, historically, and they projected um, laser lights onto it to show the attempt by ancient Romans to replicate the colors and the images and the ideas of nature in stone. And this, folks, is a Christian response to those ideas. This is a Christian response to these ideas of Roman peace, of the Pax Romana. It's in the same city, it's in the city of Rome, it's separated, however, by way more than a, a, a millennium, a thousand years, but as you can see, it is very obviously building on the same ideas. You've got this giant acanthus plant starting in the center, and spreading in all directions, sustaining all sorts of life. You could say that this is the church's hijacking of the language and the images of imperial authority, the church taking over the ideas of power for the, from the ancient world, from the Roman world, which in part it is, but in another sense, this is a very profound Christian criticism of Roman ideas of peace. From a Christian perspective, the peace of the Roman Empire was achieved, but at a, an enormous cost, an enormous cost, because that peace was the imposition of conformity and getting rid of anybody who would stand up to that conformity. If you stepped out of line with the principles of Roman peace, this is what they, they did to you. They literally crucified you. So it was a peace which was achieved through violence. It was a peace which was maintained through the threat of violence. And ultimately, from a Christian perspective, the peace of Rome, the cost of the peace of Rome was liberty and with it dignity. This church, this is the church's response where it takes that image, the instrument of death in the time of the empire, and it represents Christ triumphing over that death on the cross. This is the transformation of the imperial Roman instrument of death, the cross, to where the cross becomes, as you can see here, the tree of life, where Roman instruments of death become Christian instruments of uh, redemption. It's stating that the peace of the peoples will be achieved not through, by, not through domination of an earthly man-made empire, the peace of the peoples of the world will be achieved through salvation brought by Christ. And as you can see, it spreads in all directions. Like the monument we looked at earlier, it sustains all sorts of life. There are birds, there are creatures, great and small, inhabiting the branches. There are humans, saints, uh, Dominican saints um, by and large, because this is a Dominican church, so 
though this is a Christian message, of a, this is a message from a Christian sponsor, um, but you can see that this is a Christian subversion of those ancient Roman imperial ideals. These are the ideals that Columbanus builds on. He takes these ideas and he, 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 he develops them as only an Irishman could have, as he says himself. He takes these ideas of global peace and harmony and he takes other images from the ancient past and he adapts them to his own particular circumstances. A popular image for representing peace in the ancient world was the body, the human body. You know, in your body, all the limbs, all your organs worked in a coordinated way for their mutual benefit. If your liver decides it's having an off day, you're in trouble. So your liver isn't allowed to do that. And from a Roman perspective, the body of the world exists in harmony and in peaceful coordination because it is being governed by the head. And that was Rome. Roma Caput Mundi. Rome, literally, the head of the world, the head of the body of the world. Therefore, peace exists because Rome imposes peace from the top. Early Christians, like St. Paul, take over that idea of humanity as a, as, as, as a body, as a global body. But from a Christian perspective, the head of that body is Christ. And the parts of that body work together not because they're forced to, but because they're animated by a key consideration for Christians. And that key consideration they termed caritas, which is a difficult word to, tra word to translate. It, it means, caritas means love, but not sort of romantic love. It means charity. You get the word charity. It's where you act not out of your own selfish self-interest, where your actions are guided by a sense of what every what would benefit other people, the people you live with, your neighbors, the people you share the planet with. Columbanus takes over that idea and he incorporates that idea in his letter. And this is a blistering letter sent to the Pope, sent to Pope Boniface. And in that letter he says, yet for the peace of the gospel, yet the peace of the gospel compels me to say to all, to shame you both, who ought to have been one choir. And this motive is joined by the greatness of my concern for your harmony and peace. For if one member suffers, all the members suffer with it. It's the idea that in the body of the church, if one member suffers, everybody must share in that suffering by offering solace and support, just as in the human body. If you bang your shin against something, it's not just your shin, shin is experiencing the pain, the whole of your body suffers because of it. And that, from Columbanus' perspective, is how the, the Christian community and the global community should treat each other. He uses a very interesting image also in this letter. You see on the, on the third line, he refers to a choir, which he chooses as an image to represent the corporate body of the church. Now, what he has in mind here is polyphony, a polyphonic choir, a choir in which different peoples with different abilities, different registers, sing different, different notes, but they produce a harmonious sound. And he sees that as a good thing. What Columbanus is promoting here is the idea of diversity within unity. Leave people do the right thing, but leave them do it in their own way. It's not about imposing a rigid conformity it's when people have respect for the differences of others. That is actually the key to Columbanus's ideal of peace. When people have enough compassion and enough charity and enough respect to tolerate the differences of others, they can exist in peace and harmonious coexistence. Um, one of the architects of the modern European un Union, Robert Schumann, for these very reasons, described Columbanus as the patron saint of all those who are attempting to build a united Europe. So I hope our political leaders, particularly these days, are burning plenty of candles to St. Columbanus. He says in his letter to the French bishops, he says to the French bishops, for the rest, fathers, pray for us as we also do for you, wretched though we be, and refuse to consider us estranged from you. For we are all joint members of the one body, whether French or British 
or Irish, or whatever our race be. This must be the first expression of a supranational, a global and international sense of identity from the pen of a barbarian on the fringes of Europe. This was a very, very important development. Therefore, you can see why Conobanus is important, not just for the period in which he was writing in the, fourth, in the, in the, in the seventh century. He's important for us uh, uh, to, to this very day. Columbanus believed that he was uniquely fitted to talk about the ideas of peace because he was an Irishman. This is from a, much, a map from a much later period, but it conveys very, very well how Columbanus perceived the world in which he lived. Um, it's a map, it's a map of the world. Um, here you have the great Eurasian African landmass. Um, if anybody can see Ireland on this map, I present them with an imaginary pint of Guinness at the end. Any takers? Well, you see the great central landmass here surrounded by the all-encircling ocean that's, that, 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 that circles the, the orb of the Earth. And if you look out here, at the very, very edges, you have the island of Britain. And beyond the island of Britain here, you have the island of Hibernia, which is so remote, which is so far away that it is quite literally, it is off the map. So, from the perspective of people living in the seventh century, Ireland is so remote, it just, just to, Ireland is so remote that it doesn't really matter. It doesn't matter. Columbanus takes that idea and he turns it completely, completely on its head. This, back to imperial times again, is an imperial representation of global peace. You have the two, co you have the two emperors and their two co-emperors, representing the four corners of the earth, representing north, south, east, and west. And you can see that they are in a fraternal embrace. They've got their hands on their swords, ready to defend each other, but they're also clasping each other in a, in, in, in a grasp of concordia fratrum, the peace of brothers. This is fraternal peace. That's what that image is meant to represent. The global peace, the four corners of the earth, held in the embrace of peace by the empire, which, as we saw, was a peace achieved through the threat of violence. This is a Christian appropriation of those ideas, and again, because it's an appropriation, it's a transformation of those ideas. Who are these people? Well, this fellow is bald, so he must, must be very, very clever. This is St. Paul, and this is his friend, St. Peter, who in Christian tradition are extremely important. They're important because Paul was the apostle to the Gentiles. Peter was the apostle to the Roman, to, to, to the Jews. So they represent Jews and Gentiles. Paul, by tradition, ended his life by being decapitated because he was a Roman citizen. Peter ended his life by being martyred, by being crucified, because he was not a Roman. He was a non-Roman. So from a Christian perspective, this is a true representation of global humanity, Jew, Gentile, Roman, non-Roman. But they are here embracing in the bonds of fraternal, brotherly, concord, and peace. So this, from a Christian perspective, represents peace between Romans and non-Romans. This represents peace between Jew and Gentile. It represents all humanity held together in the bonds of peace. Now, Columbanus thinks to himself, when does that actually come to fruition? When is that ideal achieved? And Columbanus believes that that ideal of global concord is achieved when the message of the Christian peace is spread to the ends of the earth, is spread to all peoples. And when is that achieved? Think back to the map I just showed you. It's achieved when it reaches the very, very ends of the known world. And for Columbanus, it's achieved when, it, when, when that message reaches Ireland. So from Columbanus's perspective, Ireland might be geographically remote, but in terms of the unfolding of salvation history, Ireland and the Irish play a very, very important part. He represents the coming of Christianity to Ireland and its message of peace brought by the twin apostles, Peter and Paul, in his letter to Pope Boniface. He says that the message of peace spread by the church has reached 
even as far as the western reaches of the Earth's further strand, meaning Ireland, miraculously unhindered by the ocean's surging floods, though they leaped and rose beyond measure upon every field. On those two most fiery steeds of God's spirit, I mean the apostles, Peter and Paul, riding over the sea of nations, troubled many waters and increased his chariots with countless thousands of peoples. Over the channel surge, over the dolphin's backs, over the swelling flood, it reached even unto us, the Irish. Their voice has gone out into every land and their words to the ends of the earth. Psalm 18. Um, there is a, a, a paper being presented later on in the conference about how peace is the new Irish currency. I think it's obvious that peace is also the very, very old Irish currency. And people like Colin Ballas believed that they had a mission as Irishmen to promote peace and to promote the ideals of peace uh, among the peoples they encountered. Thank you very much.